All right, welcome back, guys, to this week's podcast. This week's podcast, we're doing lessons learnt. Mm-hmm. Lessons learnt on the road. Yep. Uh, my name's Curtis. My name's Amy. This is Amy, and he is Rusty. And we've been travelling Australia for the past two and a half years. So in that two and a half years, we've learnt a lot of lessons, and we're here to show you, tell you guys what we've learnt along the way to hopefully help you guys out and answer some more questions you might have yeah share experiences and yeah little bits and pieces bit of knowledge yeah bit of knowledge <laughs> let's get into it all right so if you're wondering where we are we're on the north coast of the kangaroo island at the moment we found this beautiful spot nice green grass and this nice river We've actually got a few uh, nets in, going to try to catch the marin, fingers crossed. Yep. But anyways, while we wait for the marin to get into our pots, um, we'll get into the uh, lessons learnt. Kangaroo Island's in South Australia, in case you didn't know. <laughs> it's the third largest island in Australia. All right, that's enough facts. <laughs> um, so yeah, week one, we learned a valuable lesson. Big and one. <laughs> a big one is don't camp under trees. No, what happened in week one for us, Cyclone Debbie came through and um, where we were in Skip, it was about 100 and recorded 125 kilometer hour winds Yeah. and we had trees all around us and luckily there was a tree overhanging our caravan and luckily it, it blew over the other way, so it completely uprooted. <laughs> so we were very fortunate that that blew over the other way. Um, but you see it all the time. Uh, we see on Facebook like, posts of trees, uh, branches and limbs falling on caravans and stuff like that. So when you're camping under a tree, you really got to know that that tree is healthy and alive and there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, take into account the weather because obviously if you're going to, if it's predicted to be stormy or high winds, yeah, I wouldn't want to be camping under anything because even though it looks healthy, I mean, yeah, lightning strike, anything like that could just... Yeah, put a sudden stop to your travels, I guess, if a, you know, big limb throw, fell through your caravan. Yeah, you'd be very unlucky, but it is possible. Yeah. Another valuable lesson that we have learnt while on the road is get yourself a nice camera at the start. Um, for us, we, we used our phones and we used probably, I'd say, one of our older GoPros, and now we sort of regret that in a little way because we didn't get beautiful shots like we can do now on the, the Nikon. Yeah. So you, you're more camera, so investing yeah, in Yeah, so halfway through the lap, um, my my old man, my parents met up with us and I got, and he gave me my sister's Nikon D3200 to try out and really try photography and all that stuff really well. And I picked it up. I enjoyed it. I love it. I love doing photography. I'm no expert, but it's a really good hobby to have on the road. Now, in that first year, we missed out on so many beautiful shots because I didn't have a good camera yeah. and I didn't have that knowledge behind me. That it seemed, it's like anything in life. The longer you use something, the better you get at it. Uh, these days, we've got the Nikon D5600, so it's a little bit of an upgrade and we got some magnificent shots with that. Um, but touching on the camera topic as well, you've got drones. Yeah. Uh, if you're traveling Australia, you need to buy a drone. Seriously, everyone's doing it. Um, there's, there are restrictions in national parks and stuff like that. But in the end, y you're very free to use a drone in Australia. It's very uh, unlikely you'll be in a spot where you can't use it. Even if you just got to fly it up um, 30, 40 meters, take a picture of your camp and then come back down, that picture will look so good on your Facebook or you can print it out at home and put it on your wall. Yeah, good memento. Really good memento. And you can pick up a cheap drone from DJI for like six, $700 now, and it'll do fantastic stuff. So, And I've done a review on that as well uh, in one of the previous episodes, and that's yeah. a spark. Get yourself a good camera and consider getting a drone. Mm -hmm. That's a good lesson learned. Yep. And I mean, a good, you know, the new GoPro as well is really good for image stabilization. So you get a really good, uh, if you're filming, if you like to film, the new GoPro is really good. Um, it means you don't have to film with a bulky camera. It's just a nice ready to go action camera and you take it anywhere, do anything. So yeah, waterproof, dustproof and yeah. Yeah. So that as well, a GoPro 7 is a really good investment if you're going to do Australia. Yeah. Um, cause you got snorkeling, you got hikes, you got oh, so much. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, obviously you can see with all with what we just told you, once you dive in, you want to get everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is well worth it if you're doing this trip of a lifetime. Even mini trips, you know. You, oh, it's just good to document it, yeah. Like we, we went to Schnelling Beach before mm -hmm. and there was a seal in the ocean and we just flew over him and just was watching the seal um, catch fish. It was absolutely amazing. Which you can't see that from the shore. No, and without a drone you wouldn't have seen it, you know. It would have been very, very tough, so... Yeah, good camera equipment. <laughs> so another valuable lesson that I learned because I set the rig up initially um, with the 12 volts and the batteries and stuff like that is I went cheap on a battery, a uh, cheap AGM battery off eBay. Um, it wasn't that cheap for a battery. It was still like $200, $300 for the battery. Um, but it, for an AGM, it's kind of the bottom bottom range. Yeah. And the problem with that was it leaked, and AGMs aren't meant to leak. It was meant to be a sealed battery, so I couldn't flip it on its side or anything, and it, and it absolutely destroyed itself within a year of having it. Um, so I guess yeah, we sort of um, got what we paid for in that respect. Yeah, and it's just it, just trying to deal with that on the road as well is just a pain in the bum. So. Invest in a good battery system and it'll look after you. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, battery system definitely is an important thing if you're wanting to be off-grid um, and free camping a lot. You want a decent uh, battery and solar, I guess. A good solar setup as well. Yeah. Like Amy said, a good solar system. I, I'm not going to go too deep into this. Uh, we had a good solar system at the start and we've just added on over time we've added 350 watts in total we've added since we've been on the road so if you're traveling for a long period of time always get as much as you can at the start that way you don't have to worry about solar because the, the bigger system you have charging the less stress it will be on your batteries if you just got a little solar panel with the big batteries it ain't going to work you always want to have more solar capability than less and less batteries. Yeah, and you just want to think about what you're doing. Obviously, we like a lot of solar and a lot of batteries because we do our video editing and do our blogs and stuff. So for us, you know, we need that more power. But if you're not wanting to, you know, do video editing stuff, obviously, yeah, you'll look into it and you'll find, probably find you'll need probably a bit less, yeah. just depending on what you want to do. Yeah, everyone's situation yeah, everyone's, is different. Yeah, situation and situation. Generally, is people want to run, run the fridge lights and all that. So, but every, everyone's setup is completely different. Yeah. So, we're not going to dive too deep into that. <laughs> yeah, just uh, that was a lesson learned. Just get good batteries and get a good 12 volt and solar setup at the start. Yeah, sort yourself out. At the Less start. headaches. Yeah. yeah. Lesson learned is making sure you dust proof the caravan. Um, in particular, second hand vans, but I do know new vans still do have a bit of dust issues. Uh, for us, even though our van is off-road, it still is not completely dust-proof. Um, we have reduced the dust, but we still get dust in it. You can't fully seal a caravan. Yeah. As, as much as you try, you can't do it. You can buy the pressure systems that force pressure in. You can buy a 12-volt one, so it's always running and pressurizing, but you will most likely get dust in if you go off-road in Australia. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Try to do a few test trips, uh, seal it up as best you can. Uh, for us now, if we're going on a really dusty road, we get masking tape. So that's one of our tricks. And we'll, we'll masking tape the door vents, um, masking tape the windows, any opening or hatch on the outside of the caravan, we'll masking tape up. And that has helped uh, reduce the dust going in. But bear in mind, when you peel the masking tape off, you might have residue, but it'll all come off with soapy water and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so don't damage your paint or anything with masking tape. Just even try a little bit first. And if you notice something's going wrong, don't masking tape. Yeah. There's heaps of ways you can do it. Um, but yeah, you'll figure it out. Just make sure you seal up the vents and stuff like that. And yeah. And, and for all the blokes out there with, who's got misses, who, who have got uh, wives and girlfriends, you really want to stop the dust coming in to make them happy because <laughs> there's nothing worse than your missus or your wife coming out of the caravan in a nice white shirt and it have red and orange dust all over it. <laughs> we've, we've gotten used to it now. We're, dust is a part of our life. <laughs> um, but for someone new, just be very careful and be <laughs> tread lightly in the dust scenario and try your best to eliminate it. So yeah, that's, that's dust. <laughs> another big thing, another 
must have item and a lesson learned is get yourself a good water filter. Uh, because filling up in all these towns and country towns, the water is not as safe as you think, I guess. Um, when you're in major towns, you've got it coming through, you know, old pipes, stuff like that. When you're going more remote and rural, it potentially could be bore water. A lot of the time it's going to be bore water, so it could be higher in salt, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, in caravan parks, then generally can be the worst place because caravan parks are really old, like 30 years old. So then pipes underneath may not get touched. So um, I guess just a good filter system that eliminates bacteria and also eliminates sediment and um, gives you a nice tasting odor as well. Yeah. Because the worst thing you want is to get sick on the road from water. Uh, we have been very fortunate because we've always used a filter when we're filling up our tanks that we've never been sick yeah, with water. Yeah, we've never water. been sick with water, yeah. And we've filled up all over the country, you know, Cape York, the Gibb. The most purest water we've ever filled up has been Hell's Gate in Queensland, right on the Queensland NT border. Their water was phenomenally clean. I think they're actually in the process of trying to get it uh, certified to be bottled and, like, sold as spring water. That's how good that water was. Yeah, so if you're up there... Fill up your tanks there because it's get water. bloody beautiful yeah, water. Nice tasting. <laughs> and it was like in the next town over, it was full of uh, lime and calcium. <laughs> and you could see that on all the, the shower taps and stuff like that. So and that just dries your skin up. And you're right. All right, another lesson learnt. This item Kurt had told me about. He said we should put one in. I said, no, nah, we'll never need it. We don't need that stuff. And now it's probably one of the best things we've ever added to the caravan. What I'm talking about is a diesel heater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so diesel heater, I mean, we haven't needed it really until now in this bottom end. We're in spring at the moment. Yeah, spring. Come out of winter, so it's starting to warm up, but bloody hell, I'm so glad we put that diesel heater in. It just makes the morning so much better. Yeah. Um, and if you've got a diesel heater, you'll know exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, change of diesel heaters that you can buy all in different price range we went with the the budget one the old chinese diesel heaters and we haven't had any problem with that so far um so and you can get the really expensive ones which obviously perform a lot better yeah more, um, more tweaks more yeah more programming like, and stuff you can do for that yeah exactly so if you can afford the better one get it um but otherwise the cheap ones do the job you just got to play with it a bit more but yeah highly recommend a diesel heater yeah so much better now <laughs> and like on top of heating the cooling as well when we were in the top end the aircon was a must for us as well so if you can get aircon obviously get that as well so another thing that i found on the road is connectors uh especially for when you're towing something if you're not towing something it's not really a problem but your anderson plugs and your 12 volt pin uh on the back of your car uh, when they're not in use, um, make sure that they are sealed, especially your Anderson plugs. You can buy Anderson plugs that have got rubber all around it. Yeah. And that just stops moisture, dust, everything getting into it because we are having the problems now where uh, salt water's getting in and stuff like that and the cables are starting to corrode and all that stuff. Um, whereas if I installed this rubber thing at the start, I probably never would have an issue. And obviously when you're on the road and you lose your 12 volts, it's a big problem. You're going to have to pay someone to fix it. Um, so, yeah, once again, do it right before you set off and invest in a good quality connecting system. Yeah, covers. 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 System, covers. Yeah. yeah. A lesson learnt. Um, we're pretty good at this, but is walking down four-wheel drive tracks or any dodgy looking track. I mean, park the car up hop out, walk the track. Um, we have walk tracks that have been two to three K because uh, we knew like the beach was over there, but we weren't too sure on the track. Um, so for us, we're always a big believer in walking tracks. I mean, you might drive down there with the caravan and then find out you can't turn the caravan around. So then you've got to be prepared to reverse up. Whereas you might take half an hour to walk there and back, but then you've got a good idea. All right, there could be a bad rut there. I might have to go hard right here. Um, little stuff like that, would you say? Yep. Yeah. And if you've got a drone, send the drone. Yeah, drone. To scout the track. Uh, we made, um, we learned this lesson really well at Cape York when we went down a track and the car and the caravan got a bit of a 
sticky situation. Yeah, and you we probably see that. The, I think that was in Cape York Part yeah. 2 episode. Yeah, we got... We needed to winch everything out. Yeah, it was a bit of a gnarly thing. And that was a, probably the first and only time we've sort of... Uh, that was a big eye-opener. Yeah, So for we us. calmed down after that, we're going down these interesting tracks. Yeah, we learned we weren't invincible as much as we thought we were. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, walk the tracks. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's just common knowledge, but, yeah, just uh, that's a lesson learned, just walk the track. Yeah. Slid off on our big trip. Uh, we have campfires in the back of our mind. We're young. We're naive. We see a campfire pit, pit, and we have a campfire. Now, half going about halfway around, we soon realized and we started uh, noting that um, everywhere we went, there was fire pits, uh, like not fire pits, but fires lit on the ground. Mm. And it started looking really tacky. And, and then you've got the fires on the beach, which a lot of our, well, not a lot, which some people have questioned on our video as well. Uh, which is good because it lets us know what's the right and wrong thing about fires and fire pits. Yeah, fire etiquette. Fire etiquette. And I might even do a separate video on this because it's a big one. But realistically, you want to leave no trace. And the only way you can leave no trace by having a fire is by buying a fire pit, one that's elevated off the ground. Catches everything. That catches all the coals and doesn't spill out and all that stuff. And then the next morning, like... To put it out, you can pour water on it and leave it overnight. The next morning, get a bag, just a bin bag, and put all the coal in the bin bag, tie a knot, and take that with you as rubbish. And that's the best way of having a fire pit because you leave no trace. Yeah. Mm. I think that's been a big thing we've noticed. Um, yeah, obviously, the older, the wiser you get, I would say. So, yeah, obviously. That's just experience. And experience, yeah. We've had a few beach fires at the start, and then we, yeah, the, the more sort of touching on what Kurt said, we realised, like, we're leaving black coal, um, black sand. It then, you know, if everyone's having a fire there, it's just going to get full of black sand, which is not nice. You get black black soot on your feet and stuff like that. So, um, as Kurt described, that's probably the best method we've... Uh, yeah, that's the best way of doing it. Yeah, the best way of doing Some it. Some campsites will only allow it if it's contained. So if everyone starts doing the right thing, hopefully campfires will remain to be had in all of these spots that we've been. So. Yeah, in the seasons that they're allowed. Yeah. I just wish at the start someone would have told me and then we would have been sweet and not leaving all of our fire pits everywhere. But hey, it's a lesson learned. Yeah. And now, yeah, we feel like we're doing the right thing. So yeah, yeah, share it with you guys, what our lessons. Yeah, that was a good lesson with yeah. the fire pits. And speaking of fire pits and campfires, uh, the chainsaw. The chainsaw, this is a tough one. We should have left ours at home. We I do mean, carry one. The, the idea behind it was that if we go down a four-wheel drive track, we can use a chainsaw and cut a log if it's in the way. We've never had that issue in the two years that we've been doing, two and a half. And we it's, cut a few little ones when we are in Bruny Island, I think you would have seen, but the saber saw was all we yeah, needed. So a saber saw, it's like a, it's a 18 volt uh, it's like they also call them demolition saws or re recirculating saws. Recip saws. Recip. As anyway, and, the saber um, saw. We'll put a picture. Yeah, and you get a long blade and it just cuts through. They're the best things you can buy, um, and they're a lot better than a chainsaw. Yeah. You can buy uh, eighteen volt chainsaws as well now. Um, the advantage is you don't have to carry fuel. You don't. You don't have to carry uh, oil bar oil there's so many things you got to carry with a chainsaw it just gets messy so a little saber saw that's all you need and you can cut logs like you know yeah six inches thick you just got to be patient and we just figure if there's like a big tree i mean we've still got the winch so that's another thing we could possibly use without having the chainsaw yeah we've got but the option when, to winch something when you're touring it, it's very rare that you come across something like that yeah i mean so. you've got to be yeah quite remote and going down tracks people haven't gone yeah so yeah, saber saw was good. Yeah. We carry an axe. An axe is great, even with the saber. We, I'd recommend taking an axe as well if you want. Um, but yeah, that was a good lesson. Leave your chainsaw at home for, for us. Yeah, petrol. Yeah, yeah get rid of it. Get and sell it to cashies. <laughs> Touch on a few lessons learnt regarding the nav, things that we wish we had put in there and a few things that would have just made it a bit better. I guess, you know, another lesson learnt. <laughs> Yep. Um, first one, Kurt's a big believer in getting a tablet for mapping. Yeah, we don't have one, um, yeah. but just a big screen that you can visually see. And the advantage is 
that both the passenger and the driver can see it. So the driver can just focus on driving and if we need to navigate somewhere else, the passenger can do that for you. Yeah. And um, yeah, just a tablet is a, is a great investment. I think, for yeah, that, that would be a good, yeah. yeah. More that if we took off again or we stopped and uh, refreshed ourselves, we probably would get a tablet. Uh, another good thing is good driving lights in case you have to drive at night. It's very rare that we've had to drive at night, but we are so glad that we've had the light bar. Yeah. Uh, spotties are great, but we don't really have room for spotties because we don't want to uh, disrupt the airflow through the front end. So we just stick with the light bar and that's been fantastic at night. Um, we've seen a lot of wild animals through it and it's, yeah, it's really good. So Yeah, not just for driving at night, but we have done a few early mornings and it's been good first thing in the morning when it's dark, the sun's coming up to spot those wildlife on the road. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely invest in good lights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another thing that I probably should have got at the start, but I didn't really worry about it because our van second hand and it had a lot of stone damage at the front, uh, is a pair of rock tamers. Rock tamers are a big set of mud flaps on the back of your car, and that stops um, any rocks being flicked up from your car and hitting the van. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get rock tamers, and you know you can also get these nets as well, which are both really good systems. So. I wish I would have done something like that at the start, even made my own. Uh, it would have saved a lot of rock damage from going back there. But it's, it's literally only to protect that front end of the van. Nothing else really cops it. Yeah, so if you've got a new van, it it's that. probably you, you want to spend whatever it is, the grand, yeah, and get that rock tamers because it's just, yeah, it'll save your panel. <laughs> definitely, if you've got a new van, get one. Get them if you're going down dirt roads. If you're going on bitumen, you don't need it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah tip a lesson learned is always carry a small wad of cash uh, for campsites council run campsites remote campsites so for us i have a small denomination of money with uh, small notes made up of five tens and twenties for when we go to council run campsites and you need to put the money in the envelope and uh, pop it in the box not everywhere you go is going to have fpos and uh, atms and that sort of stuff especially when you go remote and you go you know to these little campsites that are away from civilization. It just pays to have a bit of cash up your sleeve. Always just have a bit of cash. I mean, not only for campsites, you could break down, someone could help you. You might be inclined to give that person $20 or you want to buy some fuel. Cash is always a good thing to have. Yeah, you don't want to, if someone's helped you, you don't, you know, if you don't want to offer your beer because you like beer, Yeah. <laughs> you can give them cash instead. Yeah, there's, there's <laughs> endless reasons and uh, on why to carry cash and where it'll come in handy so amy reckons that crocodile safety is something that we need to talk about as a lesson learned yes i don't believe it <laughs> i think there was two i can give two good scenarios on where our crocodile safety was too low looking back um, one example is when we went snorkeling at middle lagoon up on cape levic the top of wa we were in saltwater crocodile territories and looking back, we went snorkeling. We weren't far out. We we're probably about 50 meters snorkeling around the rocks. We saw pretty fish. But there has been reports that there's saltwater crocs. So looking back, I feel I think that's a bit of a silly move on our behalf. Mm -hmm. So that's a lesson learned. Uh, the other lesson, the other example was when we were fishing up in the NT uh, Queensland Gulf up at Greenbank Station. Uh, we were fishing at night. Um, we were fishing up on a rock shelf. I think we went out two nights in a row and then the third night, the, the station was unmanned. The third night the owners came down and was having a good chat to us and they were letting us know that a five metre croc lives right outside the bank we were fishing. Um, and in hindsight, we were only standing probably a metre away from the edge and we're fishing at night. So yeah, Kurt caught a delicious mud crab, but looking back, I think that was, again, um, pretty stupid on our behalf because, yeah, that five metre croc could have got us we yeah, were there two so nights in a row croc safety just take don't it seriously. Yeah, take it seriously don't let your guard down i think we were up there for so long we our guard dropped and i guess because you don't see them i mean read some, the signs yeah some people go up there and they don't see them and that just goes oh are there crocs really here but there is definitely crocs there and when you're in those croc territories just stay alert that's all i'm gonna say don't go swimming don't go swimming don't go snorkeling um don't fish at night <laughs> if you're gonna fish at night stay well back and yeah yeah big lesson learned all right, so I think that pretty much wraps up lessons learned. I think we've blabbered on for a little bit. Yeah, um, hope I've answered a lot of questions for everyone. Yeah, hopefully you took something out of that. I mean, that's just from our experience. I mean, we're probably still going to have lessons learned. We're still There'll probably on. be a part two. <laughs> yeah, we're still learning on the road, but they're the biggest points and topics that we jot quickly jotted down that we thought we'd uh, share with you guys. Yeah.
So, yeah, if you're still liking the podcast, remember to give us a thumbs up. Yeah, comment. Uh, it helps heaps. Comment, anything that you want to know. We love ideas for podcasts. We've already jotted down a few that um, some of you guys have let us know. Yeah, so. cheers, guys. Thanks for that. Yeah, podcast ideas. But, yeah, yeah. I think we're just going to sit here, finish our beer. Pull in the nets. Pull in the nets and, uh, yeah, soak up the last rays of the sun. Yep. All right. Cheers, legends. See you in the next one. Have a good one. Cat. My leg, my leg's dead. Wake up, Rusty. It's over. Rusty. Anyway. I'll sit on the mic. <laughs> you guys will play with me. <laughs> done? Can we film? Fish. Was it? Yeah. What are you eating? Come here. I don't want to hear you breathing. Come here. Come here. This uh, is not a field trip. Come here. You're gonna chase the kangi soon. Where are they? Come on. Welcome back, guys, to this week's podcast. The sun's too bright. It's fine. I can't see. Just squint. <laughs> Why does the sun eyes. have to come back out? It hurts my eyes.